Uh, thank you, whoever you are. Um, <laughs> <laughs> delighted to be here. It's great to see so many 10, 11, 12 year olds out there. Uh, I'm going to talk about something um, that's very dear to my heart. Um, most of you know I've been in the games industry some time, heavy involvement with IDOS since we floated in 1995, came up with some very good original IP I think over the years and obviously the video games industry is a fantastic industry, all you do is spend all day hanging around with uh, Lara Croft and meeting Angelina Jolie on the set, lives wonderful in the video games industry but it wasn't always thus. Uh, 20 years before that uh, I started a company called Games Workshop with uh, two old school friends. I'm the really handsome one at the far end, and this guy, Steve Jackson, and the guy in the middle was John Peake, but um, he left very early because as soon as we discovered Dungeons & Dragons, he was no longer interested in, in, in the games industry, and yet Dungeons & Dragons was a thing that absolutely motivated and drove us to want to do something different in the games industry. So we started off by started this company, Games Workshop. We reached out. This was the viral spread of the time, this uh, full-color, glossy magazine you see in front of you called Owl and Weasel. Uh, this is February 1975. We sent it to everybody we knew in games. And one of the recipients was the young Gary Gygax in late Geneva, Wisconsin, who just invented this game called Dungeons & Dragons. Now, here it was, nothing fancy. It was a designer game uh, toolkit, effectively. And yet its influence has been so great, not just in paper and pencil role-playing games, but throughout the whole games world in which we exist today. I mean, without D&D, what would World of Warcraft have been, for example? And paper and pencil, pencil role-playing, uh, groups of people gathered together, going on these fantastical adventures that they created through interactive theater, which they conducted on the fly, in many ways gives greater freedom than many of the video games today in that there's the, the, the storyline is created on the fly by the participants. It's not going along a, a predetermined arc determined by the, the games designer. And I think, in a sense, those were the kind of, for me, the, the glory days of, of role playing and, and interactive entertainment way back then, pre technology. And there's many things to learn from DD. I think that people talk and move forward into, as we know, the digital age. So, Steve and I, we imported six copies of D&D from, from TSR, from Gary Gygax. We went over to Gen Con. This was in 1976. Uh, the other people on the... There's Steve looking grumpy at the front. At the far end is Fritz Lieber, the science fiction author. Then Gary Gygax. Um, Professor Bark, who invented a game called Empire of the Petal Throne. Myself holding the boxes. And Rob Koontz, who did a lot of the design work on D&D. And this was um, Gen Con 1976. We also got to see Miss Wisconsin 1976. <laughs> uh, we came back and had to live in a van because um, we had to make a choice. We couldn't raise money. Rather like people can't raise money today for video games, always raising money for content has always been frightening. And we had to make a choice at that time. Do you want somewhere to live or somewhere to, to ha operate? So. We existed for nearly four months in Steve's van. And, but if you're passionate about something, it doesn't seem like hardship. It certainly doesn't seem like work. It's something you're very enthusiastic. And in those early days, I'm sure we made hundreds of mistakes, but it was fantastic just kind of driving the whole industry and just making it happen. It was very exciting. So this office is about the size of a bread bin. Um, John Peake had left by that point, point. And we realized, because we weren't able to get D&D into retail outlets, that we should and open our own store. And um, this is the opening of the very first Games Workshop back in April 1978. If anybody were you in that queue, please step forward. I'm yet to meet one of those people. Of course, Games Workshop's growing up, did more professional, um, much more corporate branded logos and stuff. And indeed, this, this store is, is now closed down. I drove past it not long ago. It's now the Bosnia and Herzegovina <laughs> Community <laughs> and Advice Centre. Um, but there we are, that's progress. <laughs> <laughs> and of course, Workshop created its own IP because another lesson I learned early on, which I think I carried on in, in IDOS, is that if you want to build real value in a company, you have to create your own intellectual property. Now, D&D, wonderful though it was, 
belonged to TSR, and we had a three exclusive distribution agreement for, for D&D. &D. And um, <clears throat> at the end of that three year period, in, in 1978, Garigax said to us, let's put TSR and Games Workshop together, create a, a, a global games company. But Steve and I, in true British tradition, were violently independent, and we said no. <clears throat> and that's one of the reasons why Warhammer w came about. We had to replace D&D. Um, &D. So three guys, Rick Priestley, Richard Halliwell, and Brian Ansel, set about creating Warhammer. And Warhammer's become an incredible brand over time. And of course, the workshop is now you know, 300 stores, close on the stock exchange, doing wonderful things. <laughs> and yet it was still niche in, in our mind. And in April, in 1980, we used to run a a convention called Games Day. And uh, Penguin Books came along to Games Day and were amazed at this phenomenon that was going on. This role playing, 5,000 people crammed into a hall, seemingly possessed by some weird sort of uh, <coughs> desire to, to role play being wizards and heroes and killing monsters and finding treasure. And Geraldine Cook, who was the editor, said, um, Steve and I, would you like to write a, a book about the hobby of role-playing. And we said, well, rather than writing a book about it, why can't we write a book that is role-playing? And that's how the Fighting Fantasy game books was effectively born. Um, we submitted a, a, a concept, a document about um, role-playing, one person taking elements of role-playing, simplifying it, replacing the dungeon master with a book with multiple choices, branching narrative with a game system attached to it. They couldn't quite get their head around that, and they took over a year to decide whether to do it or not. In the meantime, we wrote to George Allen Unwin about the possibility of doing interactive Lord of the Rings books. We got a rejection letter in about two weeks, thank God, because if we'd allowed to, be done, to have done that, we would have been effectively a work for hire, making interactive adventures based on Lord of the Rings. But because George Allen Unwin said no, it then gave us the opportunity to create our own IP. And they signed up Fighting Fantasy, and this is the very first copy that came out in, in um, August 1982, which, as everyone knows, is 30 years ago. And one of the things we wanted to do with, with Penguin is that they couldn't decide whether it should be Puffin or Penguin, um, and also they wanted to do uh, Commission the artists. Now, through our seven years doing workshop stuff, you know, we've obviously created games with this real hardcore monsters that make people think they're going to have their faces ripped off and uh, fall on, on uh, poisonous spikes and, and, and have a terrible time. So we decided in our contract that we would demand that we commission the artists. And this is the, the cover art for Warlock um, from Peter Jones. And we wanted to be very evocative and um, sort of crying out to the, for the reader. Now, for those of, and this is <laughs> some young bloke writing it, and, um, <laughs> and um, so Warlock of Firetop Mountain came out in 1982. Um, it didn't really sell very much in the first three or four weeks um, because you know, the salespeople didn't understand what an interactive book was and the retailers didn't understand what it is. But suddenly, like the viral spread of today, the, some playgrounds picked up on it, told their mates, and suddenly, whoosh, it was out of print. And this was fantastic. And still no belief from Penguin. They reprinted it, I think, 20 times in a period of six, six weeks. And for those who don't know what it, uh, Fighting Fantasy is, it was a, it's a book broken up into 400 numbered paragraphs, which you read sequentially make no sense whatsoever. You are the reader. You are the hero of this book. So rather than reading passively about somebody else's adventures in a traditional novel, we empowered the reader to make all the choices. And soon that became more relevant, this sort of interactivity, pre-digital, a, a story written in the... <coughs> hello, <laughs> in the uh, second person present, inviting you to make all the decisions. And this really excited the imaginations of, of 10 and 11 years old. So let's do a little straw poll. H who's read a Fighting Fantasy game book? Fantastic. This is easy. Um, and as you know, you all cheated. 
You used to see people on the tube with their five-finger bookmark, effectively taking a little peep around the corner, oh, I don't like that choice, and going back again. And uh, they became an extraordinary success. Here we are, you meet all these characters, were they friends, were they foes? Only you could, by trial and error, find out whether they were. There was a game system attached to it involving two very simple attributes, skill and stamina, and the third one, luck, which I won't talk about too much now, but it's effectively comparing your skill, which is your ability to, to, to fight, and stamina, how much uh, wounds you could, you could withstand. And you were finding treasure, and of course that lit up people's imagination. They felt they were finding all this stuff, killing monsters, finding treasure, overcoming problems, it was learning about prob problem solving, puzzle solving, choice and consequence. And uh, they became a huge success. And, but a lot of the traditional educationists thought they were a bad thing. Uh, in fact, the, uh, the evangelists wrote an eight-page warning guide against fighting fancy, saying, that if you read these books, um, you're going to be taken over because you're interacting with, with ghouls and demons and undead. And uh, you know, it's a great warning for society. So the kids thought, fantastic, we'll have some of that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so they became a, 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 these uh, naysayers were actually promoting this series. You can't buy that kind of PR. It's brilliant. And uh, they were you know, a huge success. Uh, some of the titles that came out for us to do them, City of Thieves. Uh, Death Trap Dungeon, um, remember in 1984 this came out, a typical children's book would sell about three, 4,000 copies in the UK. Death Trap sold nearly 400,000 copies and was a you know, huge success. So to date there's been 17 million copies of Fighting Fantasy sold worldwide in uh, 30 languages. There's still new territories picking them up. Recently uh, Chinese versions came out and there's a uh, simple Chinese version. There's been some very bizarre covers. You have to make your own mind up about this one. This is uh, <laughs> the special camel toe edition from Japan. <laughs> Not sure what they're doing selling this stuff to 11-year-olds, but um, I, hey, that's culture. So um, here's the, the whole series, um, nearly 60 of the original set, uh, known affectionately as the Green Spine books by many people. And uh, it was so popular at one point that uh, publishers even did a TV ad. Confronted by fire-breathing gorgons, you can look in your pack for something to offer them, turn to page 36, or turn to page 90, draw your sword and fight them. <laughs> So, as I mentioned, is Work of the Devil, uh, another great PR, thanks from some suburban housewife who phoned into a local radio station and said that her son, having read one of my books, levitated. Fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> For £1.25, oh, we can fly? <laughs> Brilliant. We'll have some of that. I remember being on Saturday's Stoop Superstore, uh, had number one, two and three in their bestsellers lifted children's books going through the whole of the top ten with John Craven. He asked me when I was going to write a proper book. Brilliant, thanks. <laughs> we are actually getting millions of people reading here, you know, reluctant readers. Oh, well, never mind. And uh, someone recently tweeted saying, um, uh, great to hear the new Fighting Fantasy game book uh, around. Um, it was, uh, it was uh, down to Fighting Fantasy that I had my first sexual experience. I used to go in every month to buy a new one struck up a relationship with the, with the girl behind the counter there and, you know, one thing leads to another. So, Fighting Fancy, we're responsible for a, a relationship in there somewhere. Uh, <laughs> Fighting Fancy was also a computer game way back when. You can see these stunning graphics here of, uh, of the, of the um, Spectrum and also on the Commodore 64. There's been a Warlock Firetop Mountain DS game, but not in Europe, it's in the UK in the USA only. There's a Death Trap Dungeon game. Um, the, the publishers, Idos Interactive, whoever they are. <laughs> now, the brilliant publishers, Idos Interactive, employed the very young Kelly Brook to be uh, the starring character of Death Trap Dungeon. 
And Death Trap Dungeon is, is, in a way, how I got into video games from jumping shit from workshop to into, um, into video games, in that Domark, when it started in, in the early 80s, run by uh, Mark Strawn and, and Dominic Wheatley, uh, came to me because they'd seen how well Death Trap was riding in the charts, and they asked me to design their very first computer game, Eureka, before um, Domark um, went on to metamorphose into, into uh, IDOS, uh, at which point I joined the company. So five years ago, do the maths, it was the uh, 25th anniversary. We did a hardback edition of, uh, of, the, of the Warlock Fight Top, top, top Mountain. And there's Steve and I at Forbidden Planet doing a signing. And I did another signing last week at Forbidden Planet for the 30th anniversary and to announce uh, the new book, Blood of the Zombies. Now, I'm, you know, it's, been, it's taken me two years to write this book, finding the odd out here and there, but I've really enjoyed doing it to have to, and using Twitter to, to communicate with the fans directly, getting response, using Twitter to decide which, the, what the name of the book should be. Should it be Blood of the Zombies or Escape from Blood, Zombie Castle? Got a thousand responses to that in less than 24 hours. It's brilliant. All the positive stuff I got from people via Twitter when, when, the, when the, my laptop crashed and I lost about 20% of my book, that was brilliant to help me through it. And we wanted to celebrate the 30th anniversary. I was going to do something with Steve about around Firetop Mountain, but he felt disinclined to do it this time. Maybe we'll do something around the 40th anniversary. It'll probably take us 10 years to write another one. Um, so I decided to pitch Blood of the Zombies because having been in the games industry, the video games industry for 20 years, it was interesting to see the everlasting love of zombies. And I'd never done a, a zombie-only book. So started off by writing it in the usual medieval world of Valencia and realized that why not put into contemporaries? But I didn't go the whole hog. This adventure set in, in, a, in a medieval castle, so kind of straddle both, both worlds. Um, and was I going to write it for the 10-year-old of today or the 10-year-old of 1982? Hopefully it's going to appeal to both. So what's the difference about Blood of the Zombies for today or well, the contemporary setting? There's no skill or luck. So even though fighting fantasy in the 1980s was a simplification of a traditional role playing like Dungeons and Dragons, today's youth have got even less time and everything has to be totally intuitive and immediate gratification. So stripped out some of the um, the dice rolling from, from Fighting Fancy, which in itself was very uh, simple. And so there's a new combat system, and everyone seems to like it. And uh, even use Twitter for asking people to be in the book was also a good thing. So I think we got about eight or nine people in the book out of Twitter, and two people who demanded to be in, and because of their celebrity status, I, I put them in anyway. So you'll find uh, uh, Charlie Higson's in there, and also Tom Watson, MP, who uh, led the Leveson Inquiry, is now a, a zombie in, in my book. So uh, <laughs> that's great. And there's a number of video game Easter eggs in the book, and I hope you find them all. And the art? Well, I decided to use a, 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 a great artist that uh, had, been talk, had been told about, uh, Greg Staples, um, who'd done a lot of art for... Um, Judge Dredd in particular. And he sent me three uh, sketches, very, very loose. So there's one with the zombies escaping for a, from a, uh, a cell. Another one was the, the zombie woman with, the, with a chainsaw. And the last one was the zombie escaping through the door, which is the one I chose in the end. Here's the, the cover. And then with the, with the tones and Photoshop, we've got this sort of very vivid, striking cover. And I'm delighted the way it's turned out. Um, for the interiors, again, I wanted to use a, an established fantasy artist, make, it, make people feel that they're really being attacked by the zombies. And I think Kevin Crossley did a brilliant job too. And here's one of his art that is actually coloured up. And, of course, being in the digital age, wouldn't want to miss out on this opportunity. So uh, hopefully, of course, we want people to buy the book, and leave it in pristine condition on their bookshelves, and also download the app so they can play it on their journeys to work, etc. So working with Tin Man Games, who've been experts in, in creating uh, 
gamebook uh, technology, and this is going to be the app's going to be out in uh, at the end of September. And here's a kind of uh, an intermediary screenshot of Blood of the Zombies on the on the on the iPad. And there will also be some additional art from uh, one of my old Mar old fighting fancy artists, Martin McKenna. That will be inside the app, but not inside the book. So that's it. Um, You've got to kill them all if you want to win this game. There's no getting away from it. You cannot win unless you've found and killed all the zombies. I was delighted to see uh, Eurogamer yesterday give it a 9 out of 10. Swift and exciting. I'm sure they're not talking about me there. Um, it was great to have a 9 out of 10 Eurogamer. We all know in this room how hard it is to get a, a 9 out of 10. Um, and I know I've only got half an hour, so I've got to stop. But to f finish off, I will be signing copies for all you 10 and 11 year olds outside at, at, during the break. You can buy a copy from Blackwells who are outside there. Um, I hope you enjoy it. I've really enjoyed doing it. It's clearly not driven by monetary reasons because it's going to be a, a nostalgic purchase by people. But um, yeah, it's, it's great to get back to my roots, so to speak. So uh, thank you very much. <laughs>